Okay, carrying on with the discussion of matrices, we're going to completely change subject, let go of our discussions from before, and talk about another strand of algebra that was happening all the way through the you know, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and so forth. Completely different subject, unrelated to anything we've just done. So let me just point out, you know, something about equations. So often people use like a balance model to explain what equality means, at least, at least as a model to motivate why we believe certain things we do about algebra. For example, if, you know, if box A and box B are equal in some sense, meaning that maybe have the same weight, they balance this way. So here's a pictorial representation of equal weights, if you like. Maybe box C equals box D, in that sense, equal weights. So if you've got this sort of model in your mind, then of course we like to say, well, if I double the number of boxes, on the left and number, number of boxes on the right. It should still stay balanced, still stay balanced. So we like to believe that if, if one quantity equals a second quantity and we decide to multiply everything by two, double things, we still have a balanced system. So there's a, a belief about equality, if you like, that multiplying by a scalar actually um, doesn't, doesn't interrupt our equality. Um, if I multiply by sort of negative one, then I talk about an anti-box, an anti boxes of A and anti boxes of B. I've, I've got no trouble with anti apples and anti bananas and anti dots and so forth. There's people who know my exploding dot stuff know anti is very good. Um, it's still true here. All right. Another thing we like to believe is that uh, if instead of, uh, if I've already got two things equal and suppose I add two, two objects on the left and the same two objects on the right, then it remains balanced. That uh, adding a scalar to both sides of equality maintains equality because we feel like in this balance model that feels intuitively right. So we'll just believe this is true as well, a property of equality if we want to get fancy. But the one that's hard is we've got one equation and a second equation. So suppose I uh, bring box A here and box B over here as well. Since they were balanced over yonder, they'll be balanced over here as well. So we like to believe that if you've got one equation, A equals B, and the second equation, C equals D, feel free to add the components on the left and add the components on the right, and you'll still have equality. All right, so I've got no claim that you have to believe this. I've got no, I make no claim that this model is actually the right way to go, but it's very motivating. But let's now play the game that, all right, we're going to believe these properties. So everyone's giving me some equations that multiplying by scalars, adding and subtracting scalars, and adding equations maintains equality. If that's the game we're going to play, then let's play the game in full and see what consequences come of it. So let me quickly clean the board, because how these principles work out in an algebra class appear as follows. So for example, I, I'm doing some problem, I've got 15 x's minus 10 y's plus 25, apparently it's 15 minus 5 z's, 5 z's. Um, suppose I'm, you know, doing some, some calculation, some, some thinking, and I'm led to an equation like that, and that's pretty ghastly. Um, can I make that look simpler? Well, yeah, by property of equality, I, I can multiply through by any, any scale I like, I choose to multiply by one-fifth. I actually don't believe in dividing. Dividing is just actually multiplication by fractions. That's fine. So I multiply through by one fifth, which is a property I mentioned earlier. I've got to get three x's minus two y's plus five is ten minus z. Great. Um, what I could do now is I could add a scalar to both sides. Maybe I'll add negative five to both sides. In which case I have three x's minus two y's equals five minus z, which is great. Um, now comes a little bit weird, I'm just pointing out the weirdness right now. Um, often we like to bring all the variables to one side of the equation, all the non-variables to the other side, because it just organizes our minds a little bit better, just a style thing, you don't have to, it just tends to be helpful to a lot of people. This z on this side is a bit of a pain, but I do know the equation that z equals z, so I'm being very technically fine, that uh, precise. So I could actually add these two equations, add z to both sides if you like, but what I'm really doing is adding two equations this property, I get 3x's minus 2y's plus z is 10. And that's a little bit simpler, and maybe I can do some thinking on that one instead. So that, that sort of explains the algebraic process of using these properties that we like to believe are true. All right. Uh, but a lot of this is really, well, well, let me be clear. So in an algebra class, we find that some equations are much easier to solve in general than others. That anything that involves squaring or cubing or square rooting or sines of angles are a pain. There's a certain class of equations where everything has no powers, everything straightforward, is, uh, that makes life easier. So we call a, an equation linear if after some algebraic work that it could be written in the form some number times a variable plus some other number times a variable, no powers, no square roots, nothing weird, just the variable itself, plus another number times a variable, and so on. 
So there's been a lot of focus then on how to solve linear equations. They are manageable, we can actually do all the work on these, and it turns out to be a very rich theory in its own right. But, but there's some, something to point out. So, in high school world, we get so used to everything being whole numbers, but technically, half x plus root 3y equals pi is actually a linear equation. Just a number times a variable, no powers, plus another times another variable, and so on. Something like 1 over x minus 1 equals, I don't know, 2 over y minus 7 plus 3 wouldn't be called a linear equation, but I've got a footnote to add to this. Or something like a 2x squared plus y plus, I don't know, uh, 1 over z equals uh, 14. People probably wouldn't call that a linear equation either. But of course, everything, here's my footnote, in mathematics is in context. If I was thinking, say in this latter one, as x squared as the object of interest, I don't care what x is, but just x squared is the object of interest, and 1 over z is the object of interest, then actually, in the variables x squared, y, and 1 over z, this is a linear equation. Or if that guy was my object of interest and that was my object of interest, then that actually is a linear, combination, a linear equation as well. So it's all context, you know, we have these fancy definitions, but you know, what can I say? All right, however, I will point out one historical piece of quirkiness that uh, just for fun, before I go on to the next lecture, if I just said out of the blue, solve AX equals B, most people will probably think right away, okay, X is B over A. What's curious is that most people assume that I was interested in x, that x in my mind was the variable and a's and b's are sort of constants that I just don't happen to know the value for. That's even philosophically strange. And they solve for x. But actually I could solve for a and get a equals b over x, or I could solve for b and get b is ax. So it's kind of weird that our brains all only go to x as the variable. And there's historical reason for it. It was actually Descartes, I believe. So they, you know, at the time of the 1600s, people were solving equations and they let any letter of the alphabet be anything they want to be for variables. And he said, look, hang on guys, hang on guys, just to make it easier to read each other's letters, can we all just agree on a convention? That when I write an abstract equation like this, can we use the letters at the end of the alphabet, like X, Y, Z, W, U, V, etc., for the actual unknowns, and use letters at the beginning of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, and E, for constants whose value we don't happen to know? That way, it's, it just becomes psychologically easier for us to read each other's stuff. If the letters at the end of the alphabet are preferred for the actual unknowns, letters at the beginning of the alphabet for the sort of unknown un constants, weird, then that'd be great. And people agree with them. So that's the convention we tend to follow. Um, there's no reason why I have to solve for x, but we're following that convention of Descartes from 400 years ago that when there's in doubt, we're just following a social choice, always basically think the high letter alphabet letters are the ones that are the variables to be solved. Of course, you don't have to stick to that. Maybe I really do want to solve for A, in which case I should be clear in my question. Please solve for A. All right, so linear equations became all the rage in deep thinking, they're all the rage throughout history, but in the 1800s, they became very deep because a fellow by the name of Gauss figured out something very clever about them. So let's talk about that next.